Welcome to the Queens Park Report. I'm Mark Rockburn. Joining me as always is Northumberland Peterborough South MPP, David Puccini. And thanks, David, once again for joining us on uh, a new episode of the Queens Park Report. So, David, I thought we'd start with the fact that last week the uh, province announced a, a, a framework uh, without any details, or if there was a, a details of the fact that it was going to start on three phases. We have a little more detail now as to how it's going to unfold, so why don't you let the constituents know and viewers know as to how that's going to unfold. Yeah, thanks very much for asking, Mark. I, the, the framework that was announced last week had three key stages and, and had specific details on criteria that needed to be met and a specific public health criteria that needed to be met uh, to start opening and instigating those three stages. Um, and, and obviously uh, looking at the data for new COVID cases, the amount of testing that we were able to do, and our PPE supply, hospital capacity, et cetera. Uh, given strong hospital capacity to date, um, given uh, the ability now uh, with PPE and a number of other measures, uh, we've, we're starting to see a gradual trickling, um, a reopening of the economy. Uh, now we saw on Thursday a very key announcement from Minister McNaughton, our Labour Minister, laying out specific criteria businesses can meet uh, or must meet to then open. So it's specific guidelines, and I know I've shared it with our chambers, our local businesses, and uh, and then this week we've seen our last week uh, in into the weekend as effective Monday, the opening of garden centres. Um, we'll, we'll see a gradual a reopening of this economy, which um, which I know many have been waiting for, and something um, you know that that we're looking to do. But of course, it's predicated on ensuring uh, that we protect the health and safety and well-being of our residents. Uh, the premier has been resolute in that, and so that's why this staged approach uh, allows us the ability to continue. Should uh, criteria continue to be met, we'll move into stage two, um, but also the ability. Uh, to, to hold things uh, should we see outbreaks that uh, that affect obviously the health and, and safety of Ontarians. Earlier this week, David, we saw the fact that uh, um, car dealerships are able to open up as long as they uh, meet the dealerships on a, on appointment on appointment only, and a few other businesses as well. I guess the ones that uh, are starting to uh, look at when they're going to get open is the seasonal ones that rely on that seasonal mm -hmm. money and i'm looking specifically uh possibly at golf courses that are looking for looking for that time when they need the, to open up they're looking at garden houses who sorry greenhouses and landscaping companies as well that uh, you know the spring season is where they make a lot of their money because of the fact that that's the time that they're able to get those customers into their places and when do you see those restrictions lifting or easing a little bit where, you know, for car dealerships, particularly if you make an appointment, you can go in and look at and buy a new car, whereas greenhouses, it's just curbside pickup. Do you see at some point in the future where maybe going, those businesses can get the same as a dealership uh, where, you know, you can make an appointment, let them wander around a greenhouse? Mm -hmm, yeah. Yes. I mean, there's a variety of factors that go into things, obviously with dealers with, concurrent ramping up of, of product lines and of manufacturing lines um, within our auto sector, um, you know, and the ability and one must test drive a vehicle, uh, very different from, from, from buying a plant. Um, but having said that, uh, certainly being outdoors and, and the garden centers and seasonal businesses, we've started to see a gradual reopening, which will move with, with an easing of some of the restrictions. Obviously, should we continue um, along the path that we're on. And Mark, I would say it's a, it's a good path. I mean, we've seen uh, steady, uh, steady numbers in, in our county of Northumberland across the broader riding of Northumberland, Peterborough South. Uh, while we saw a minor increase uh, in Clarington um, and Peterborough, our numbers have been relatively consistent across this riding. So I think uh, residents have, have been going and making immense sacrifices to get to where we are today. Uh, we've got We've got a, certainly more to go, but there's light at the end of the tunnel and the seasonal businesses opening up is key. Um, you know, as the weather gets nicer, um, the lawn and, and maintenance uh, within our, our communities is also essential for the safety and well-being. We have an elderly population uh, who have to go out for essential reasons. And uh, the last thing we need is liability issues getting in and out of your home. 
um, in addition to major places of, uh, of employment, um, grocery stores or hospitals, things of that nature. So um, again, you know, uh, we're, the, the province is doing, is doing well. Um, I know, uh, you know, we're the largest we're the largest province in, in this country. And I know when others some often point and look at Manitoba and look at other provinces, I mean, we're nothing like many of those provinces. We have a major international hub of an airport in, uh, in Toronto Pearson, we're on the border with the United States, a major uh, shipping routes as well. Uh, so I think the only province we could legitimately look at as a comparator would be either Quebec or BC, but also our, our, our closest partner and comparator would be New York State. And so uh, I'm proud of the job Ontario has done. And, um, and, and I know people are, folks are eager to, 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 get, to go out and to, um, to shop and things. And, and it's gradually coming. David, we saw that uh, any announcements that your government mm. has made, there's never been a specific date put towards as to an actual timeline when something will open. We're seeing in Quebec where now, where they did put specific dates on things going back to normal schools and such that they're now having to retract that, those dates and say if maybe it was a little too ambitious uh, to put a date on when we see back to a little bit of normalcy. Is that part of the reason why the province of Ontario is not putting dates so people don't get that expecta expectation where okay on you know May 15th we get to do this and then May 15th comes and the government has to walk that back because we're not ready yet? Well I think we you know rather than I mean, every province is, is different, and, and I respect uh, the, the path that, that other provinces are taking, um, but, but my focus is here on Ontario, and I think that when we measure the guidance of public health, um, we look at the criteria that must be met, only then can we start to look to assigning dates to things, and I think that's why you've seen from our province will come out and we'll say, looking, we're looking at an opening in the, in, in the coming few days at, at said time, and we get very specific at 12 or 1 a.m., this is when uh, said that business will be open for curbside, or et cetera. Um, but, but it's measured. It's measured on, on the guidance of our, of our public health officials. We lean heavily on Dr. David Williams. Um, Dr. David Williams and his team regularly brief, brief us in government and, and guide that decision making. We're also regularly consulting with Retail Council of Canada, CFIB, other important stakeholders in, in determining how we go about doing this, working with our union partners as well uh, to ensure strict public health guidelines and, and labor guidelines are met when, when we do reopen. And that's why we've seen those guidelines. So I think, uh, you know, with a province as big as, as Ontario, you have to take a measured approach. We have to protect the health and safety of Ontarians. Again, I mean, I know with the nicer weather, uh, but it was only a few weeks ago um, where, where we were seeing modeling and a trajectory that was, was far worse than where we are today. It's we're where we are today because everybody's making immense sacrifice. Um, but, but our loved ones and our neighbors and our friends are too important to us uh, to, to, to ease up completely. David, obviously with the framework of uh, opening the province, it can't be done without some consultation, without some work behind the scenes. And I know that you're currently doing that behind the scenes, the work that people don't see you doing. And that is obviously with the Regional Economic Recovery Task Force, where you're meeting with the business people in this area, mayors and et cetera, finding out ways to how they feel that the economy should be started and how we should get this riding back up. How are those meetings going and what are you hearing and, and, and with this? Yeah, I would say you know meetings are going are going very well. Um, we've had uh, we've had good feedback from our chambers. Um, I'm working uh, with a number of businesses, ensuring their perspectives are met. I mean, it's critical for me that anything led is is really with the guiding light of of the feedback of our of our business community. Um, you know, it's important uh, that 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 government doesn't get caught up in ourselves. That we lean on on businesses, and I'll be the first to say when it comes to, to the expertise, the expertise is found in uh, our community and specifically when it comes to businesses, it's from our business community and our owners and, uh, and our employees and, and leaning on them and getting their feedback and, and guiding the path that we're taking. So uh, for me, that takes on a number of flavors. That takes on working obviously with our chamber, our county, um, both Peterborough, Northumberland uh, and Clarington regions. Um, it, it involves uh, focused town halls with mayors at a very municipal level, zeroing in where we get uh, some good local business perspective. Obviously, working with the Ministry of Finance and uh, 
and both Minister Ron Phillips, PA Stan Cho. We've had uh, some Zoom uh, town halls here and, and just direct calls to businesses. So it takes a number of flavors, but through it all, uh, I feel I'm getting a very good pulse of, of the concerns of businesses and I'm able to articulate that and, and tweak the programming so that it ad adequately reflects the needs of, uh, of our rural, rural business community. How important is that to be able to have this as a fluid uh, situation where changes can be made? Because obviously what it maybe is done in Clarington in one part of here isn't going to work maybe in the other end of, of Norwood or small communities, maybe smaller community of uh, maybe Colburn uh, where, you know, measures there may not work here. Completely uh, agree. I mean, it, it's very critical that we don't lose sight of the various realities. I mean, we are a collection of of communities. We've got, uh, but but what are the realities? And in, in Orono and and in Newcastle aren't too different from some of the realities in Hastings, in Campbellford, in, in Port Hope and Coburg, uh, Brighton. So so from my perspective, it's about getting out into the community, uh, but but also aware of the nuance, looking at um, you know, the, the, the communities in, in the west side that gravitate perhaps more towards manufacturing, auto, OPG, our nuclear sector on the east. Uh, we've got a lot of retired military families um, into the north, uh, a lot of small RV campground owners, etc. So, so there are definite nuances. Um, and I think through that, that blend of approaches I've been taking, I've been able to capture that nuance. And, and as always, I mean, I've been very frank. Uh, you know, we're learning as we go, Mark, and I think uh, I seek feedback from people. Just last night, I had a Zoom uh, round, ta round table um, town hall, I should say, with Mayor Crate in Trent Hills. And today, we will be asking everyone who participated for feedback. Uh, Stet, the audience in these Zoom town virtual town halls is going up with every, every town hall that I host. And um, we asked them for feedback. What can we do to make this better, more interactive? Uh, are we missing out on your neighbors, on your friends? What can I do? Uh, so I'll be the first to say we can constantly strive to improve. And it's through doing, in so doing that, we're able to capture that nuance. David, we're up on our first break, uh, Queen's Park Report, but just want to tease the viewers to let people know that we are coming back from the break. We are going to talk about those virtual town halls. To the date of this taping, you've held two already, so we can get the word out as to more that are coming up and what they can expect on, uh, w when they join these town halls. You're watching Queen's Park Report. I'm Mark Rockburn. Don't go away. The second half of the show will be right now. Welcome back to Queen's Park Report. I'm Mark Rockburn. Joining me as always is Northumberland Peterborough South MPP, David Piccini. And David, just at the end of the last break, we touched a little briefly on your virtual town halls that you were uh, hosting. Uh, as of the date that we we're taping this show, you hosted one in communities of Brighton and Trent Hills. So let's talk about what's happening during these virtual town halls and what people can expect in further ones and uh, communities and what you're hearing. Yeah, I mean, they've, it's been a great opportunity for me to connect with uh, with voters in uh, Northumberland, Peterborough South, with our constituents, uh, ensuring that we get a broad perspective, businesses, farmers, individuals, etc. Um, and and it's been it's been a good experience to date. The first one was in Brighton with Mayor Ostrander, and I've reached out to our municipalities to co-host. Um, we have uh, municipal staff. We've got uh, councillors, the mayors. Um, folks within the community and it gives us an opportunity to really drill down into the specifics on, on the downtown core let's say of a Brighton or of a Campbellford a Hastings. Um, last night we had the latest one with uh, Trent Hills Mayor Bob Crate. a great opportunity to discuss and we do start to see some of those nuances uh, you know a bit of, of campground some RV uh, cottaging etc came up last night uh, we see that more into the Trent Hills area um, and, and we had some good, good conversations about businesses. We talked about um, some of the business loans available, uh, the, the rent uh, supports, uh, commercial rent supports for, for, for businesses. Uh, we talked a bit about some of the non-for-profits and, and how they were coping. Um, individual uh, testing. We had an update from the hospital last night. I was very pleased to have um, have Rouge, the CEO from Campbellford Memorial Hospital on uh, to provide an update as well. 
Uh, so it was a great opportunity for, for residents to, to hear from a variety of individuals and just on the measures that are being taken. And it's key in, in difficult times like this that you have accurate and reliable information that's communicated. Um, and we were able to do that. And I got some great feedback. And as always, I mean, there, there were the, the odd question or two that, that I wasn't able to answer. And, and it gives me some important follow-up work to do today. So it, it, was, it's, it was good. Uh, they're getting bigger. Um, they're, they're growing. And uh, I hope more people sign up and join because uh, they've been a really good uh, discussion, focused discussion, and a great opportunity to engage with your counselors, your mayor, your MPP, uh, hospitals, et cetera. Is the general public able to participate in these, David, or is it invite only? Anyone can participate. I publicly uh, broadcast this. And again, I mean, we've been looking at opportunities uh, through you is the first opportunity I've really had to really put this out um, uh, via TV. And, and uh, you know, so I'm, I appreciate any and all opportunity. It is open for anyone. And the nice thing about Zoom is if you don't have that internet capability or the computer, you can call in. Um, so we provide all of that. Uh, we just ask folks to register. I mean, while, while, um, while to date I, I haven't turned anybody down, obviously you want to make sure you're zeroing in on that community and, uh, and, and we're, we're, we're able to have that focused discussion. Um, and I'm getting to every community and First Nations um, throughout this riding. So it's going to, to take place where we're, we'll be able to talk to everybody. And I, that's going to be very important for me. And absolutely anyone can sign up. Um, they're more than welcome. You're watching Queen's Park Report. I'm Mark Rocker. And joining me as always is Northumberland Peterborough South MVP David Puccini. And David, when we were talking about the virtual town halls, one group that you brought up is the community groups that uh, are looking to raise money in the communities. I look at the United Ways. I look at, you know, even the hospital foundations who rely a lot on community money. These are times, you know, big brothers, big sisters, all those groups that need uh, donations to come in for them to be able to do their work. I guess, what is being done for them, I guess, by the government? Because we, you know, it's hard for these groups to go out and ask people for money to support them at a time when people are struggling themselves every day to, as you stated, to pay the rent, to pay a bill. Um, is there help on the way for those groups that help uh, people in, the, in these communities? Well, that's an excellent question. So we saw, I mean, locally here, an additional $1.4 million in that can be uh, loosely allocated. And the point uh, uh, on the term loosely that I just referenced was that it gives our local municipalities, our, our county, the flexibility to pivot to respond to local needs. So in my updates with with county officials and, and our warden, um, you know, I asked that question about the $1.4 million, where it's going. I met uh, the most emerging needs in, in, within the shelter community. I asked about the food banks and a number of other uh, charities. Now our food banks, uh, in addition to getting support food banks Ontario, um, also, uh, you know, thanks to our government and the feds as well, uh, this allotment of, of 1.4 million, they were saying actually that, that, uh, that Northumberland Food for All and others were, were getting a steady stream of, of cash donations that were marginally up relative to this time last year. Uh, which is good news. That's the generosity within our community. That's people wanting to help out. Um, on a case-by-case -case basis, I have heard uh, from, from select food banks looking uh, for, for, for that additional support. That's why I sort of I you know, strive for that nuance and looking at, is that 1.4 million going? And, and when people ask, I mean, this isn't top down, this is grassroots up. Uh, I lean on our municipalities. I lean on the county for guidance there because they're really um, you know, that municipal level is where the rubber hits the road, uh, no pun intended, for, um, for, for that sort of guidance. In addition, we've seen uh, an additional, um, you know, 200 million for the vulnerable sector across Ontario. Um, our healthcare system, 3.3 billion, of which we've seen um, a massive influx into our long care facilities. We've seen a top up in pay in some of our, of our, our most, uh, uh, you know, our, our frontline healthcare workers. Um, who, who are very much working on the front lines here and some of the lowest paid uh, workers um, have had that support. Uh, in addition, uh, we heard you know, just last night in that town hall from our hospital that are actually in good capacity. They're in good shape right now. Um, thanks to additional investments from the government, obviously these aren't just investments at overnight. I mean, this is healthcare transformation that we're working on. The in investments into Campbellford Memorial, 
Memorial and NHH are widely known, um, a record 13 plus million last year. Um, and, and this is putting us in a stronger position. Um, we will have lessons learned, no doubt, from uh, COVID-19. Um, and, and, you know, I'll be the first to take feedback and to do a post-mortem and our calling on, uh, on, on, on our government to ensure we have a select committee to review. Um, but, uh, but to date, uh, capacity has been strong. And I think the infusion of money has gone to where, where it's most needed. You brought up the hospitals, David. I know you that you meet with them on a regular basis uh, to, to find out how they're how are both hospitals in your, your riding uh, faring during uh, COVID nineteen. Well, I think both are are, are in good shape. Uh, we've uh, laid out a few additional guidelines from Ministry of Health on, for example, PPE reporting. So daily, hospitals report back on their supply. We have a. Uh, uh, a sourcing team and uh, and then a supply team within government um, that works. We have a rapid deployment, 24 hours from our central procurement. And a lot of people, when they ask, I mean, we're not adverse to the global supply chain uh, issues that we're seeing um, on the tarmac in China, et cetera. The premier has been clear. He wants us to be able to respond. I think I'm proud that Ontario's had a number of uniques the Ontar through the Ontario Together portal. We've seen um, over 20,000 unique submissions on how to respond to PPEs, um, manufacturers retooling um, either to create hand sanitizer, PPE. So we've seen a remarkable response within Ontario that's positioning us to better respond for future pandemics like this. Because I'll be frank, Mark, I mean, I think Ontarians expect us to learn lessons from previous pandemics. And it's been a refreshing and welcome news that Premier Ford's been clear we're not going to find ourselves in a position where we're relying so heavily on China uh, going forward. And that's good news uh, for Ontarians. Um, our central procurement uh, warehouse, uh, the fact that we're able to uh, drive uh, that the best pricing. Imagine if every hospital fended for the, completely on their own. Uh, we would create uh, massive demand issues that would jack up pricing. Through our central procurement team, we're sourcing the best pricing. Uh, we're developing from within Ontario, some of our N95, N96 plus masks are online, ventilators, et cetera, and that's getting to where they need it. So to date, in short, uh, to your question, both hospitals, uh, from, what, from the conversations I'm having with them, are, are in good shape. Uh, the, the staff are a bit anxious, no doubt. Uh, they're very much on the front lines of what is an invisible enemy. So uh, that can't be easy for, for anyone on the front lines. And my thanks and the thanks of a very grateful community, be it our little, our windows, uh, drive alongs with our first responders, uh, the parades, uh, we're thankful and we appreciate the work they're doing. Almost out of time here, David, and uh, one, one part of the sector that I don't wanna uh, miss that we have uh, with this is the agricultural sector, because obviously Northumberland, Peterborough South is a major agriculture area with many farmers within the riding. And last week you were able to host a, a, a round table um, and with the agriculture community, uh, let's talk about that and what you're hearing from the agriculture side. Well, thanks very much for bringing that up, Mark. That's a, a, a very good point. Our agriculture community is the backbone of Northumberland, Peterborough South, number one employer. And from my perspective, it was important to drill down. I was off on the heels of a, of a good meeting with Northumberland Cattlemen Association, and we were discussing some of some of their their, their needs relative to our misman our risk management program, our set aside program. Um, I, I'm uh, to be frank. I think uh, I'd be remiss. I'm I'm a bit concerned over some of our global trade agreements where we're coughing up market share for our beef industry for some of our key sectors. Uh, so that ultimately is a federal issue, and I know you have another program where you can uh, ask the feds about that. But uh, but certainly, you know, we've been working uh, exceptionally hard, and you know, I, I would join our, our MP as well in in ensuring that uh, that our agriculture community is well represented, and uh, and that their needs are felt. So we, in addition to that, um, we spoke about the temporary foreign workers, uh, public health guidelines, Ministry of Labor guidelines to ensure that uh, our farms are in a good shape to accept those uh, temporary foreign workers. And no doubt there's someone right now watching saying, yes, but why can't Canadians do it? And I fundamentally, I take a day on any of our farms and, and tell the farmers that because for years, they've been crying out for, for laborers to work. Um, we're, we're not able to meet the demand. So I would say to them, we need our temporary foreign workers, but also for those who say, what about students? What about others? Um, 
again, I was, you know, I was appalled to see on, on our national broadcaster a reporter laugh at a young student suggesting that they would get into, uh, into the ag, uh, ag field, but that's reflective of an out-of-touch national broadcaster. But what I would say is that uh, those youth, um, they're doing a remarkable job, and we've set up a portal now uh, through, through Agriculture Ontario that can match interested youth into local farms where they can, where they can work throughout the summer. So certainly there's labor issues, um, risk management, as I said, set aside program, uh, the broader global trade deals, uh, but, but they're working exceptionally hard. And um, you know, we have good food supply programs to date, uh, relative to a, an initial a blip with the toilet paper um, and, and a few others. But when we go to that, the, the, the stores, we're seeing uh, our food and that's thankful to our truckers, that's thankful uh, to, our, thanks to our farmers. Um, but we'll apply issues if, if we don't, if we look at some of the processing plants, uh, Cargill and others where they had a, an outbreak, I know they're trying uh, exceptionally hard to get online. You've seen some of the closures of plants like Regency. So we're weathering a, a number of different storms, um, but, but my, you know, I, our ag community is, is so critical uh, to Ontario's prosperity. David, our time's up. Thanks once again for joining us on Queen's Park Report, and we'll see you in one week's time once again. Thanks very much for having me, Mark. Have a great day. You've been watching Queen's Park Report. I'm Mark Rockburn. We'll see you in one week's time.